Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices. Um, our first and only item of business today is to take evidence on the implementation of the financial provisions in the Scotland Act 2012 from Edward Troop and Sarah Walker uh, of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Both the Scottish and UK governments have published their second annual reports as required under Section 33 of the Act, and members have received copies of both reports. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite one of them to make a short introductory statement. Um, thank you very much, convener, and, and good morning. It's, it's very good to be here again. Um, and, and as you say, uh, you've got our second report, and, and I know you heard from uh, Mr. Swinney last week, and I think uh, I'd open by sort of um, repeating the point he made that the relationship between ourselves and the Scottish Government continues to be extremely good and that we're making good progress towards implementation um, of the provisions of, of the Scotland Act. Um, in a way, this is a transitional year. Um, last year, the first time I came, we, we were getting everything going, and, and next year, actually, the, the um, provisions of the Act will, will start to be in place with the two tra taxes devolved. Uh, it's been a year of, of good progress, and I think from the perspective of this committee, uh, the most important thing to note is that um, we have been able to firm up, uh, or rather actually to revise down uh, our estimates of, of costs, as you will have seen from the report, which is, as you uh, recall, when I was here last year, I was able to say that I hoped uh, that costs would move downwards, and overall they have, our estimates have moved downwards slightly, um, with the non-IT costs uh, coming down with a, a slight possible upward revision or estimate of the IT costs due to the additional uh, expenses involved in dealing with, with pensions tax relief. But, but overall, um, I'm, I'm happy that we are both clearer uh, about the uh, likely costs of implementation um, and that the overall costs have, have come down. Um, I'm obviously pleased also that the um, actual progress of implementation and the transition uh, to Revenue Scotland of the two devolved taxes as well as the implementation preparations for the Scottish Rate of Income Tax are uh, looking in good shape. Um, we've had a further OGC gateway review uh, just recently which has, has put the overall project on amber green um, which is about as good as uh, any project gets uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased overall with progress and, and obviously very happy this morning to, to answer questions on any aspects of implementation. Well, thank you very much for that uh, um, brief uh, opening statement. Um, um, most of the questions I'll be asking will certainly be uh, specifically on the second annual report, which I think is a really comprehensive document. I think in itself answers a lot of the, the questions that members of the committee might want to answer, but of course we will have others in addition to that, and we might want to tease out some of the points that are actually made in the document itself. Um, so, uh, I'll ask a few questions uh, and uh, then we'll open out the session to uh, members of the uh, committee. And the first one really is on uh, Chapter 7, uh, which is uh, powers to devolve, devolve further existing taxes and create new devolved taxes. And in uh, paragraph 46 of that, it indicates that the two governments have agreed a process of creating new Scottish taxes and or devolving existing taxes, as you have just mentioned. But then it goes on to say um, in the first bullet point that there's a need to ensure that the proposed tax would not impose a disproportionate negative impact on UK macroeconomic or fiscal policy or impede the UK single market. Do you have any examples of where that might happen? Um, no, I, d I don't think so. Obviously, at this stage, this is um, highly spec largely speculative because obviously there are no specific proposals for further taxes to be devolved. Um, uh, the criteria set out here, um, which obviously would be the context for any consultation, are intended to to capture the broader points which you know w would be taken into account anyway in relation to any domestic UK tax proposal, but obviously would also be relevant to, to the evolution of any tax. So I, so I don't have any uh, specific examples because neither we nor the, the, the um, UK government have, have, have turned our minds to specific taxes to be devolved. 
Okay, thank you uh, very much for that. In, in the following chapter 8, uh, Effective New Powers on the Scottish Block Grant, in 51 it talks about in the two or three transitional years starting in 2016-17. I'm just wondering whether you, uh, given your experience and involvement so far, um, believe it should be two years or three years and why that should be the case? Well, um, I mean, it, it isn't a matter for us or for HMRC. I mean, obviously, the, this, is, this is a fiscal matter uh, be, between ministers. Uh, the decision on two or three, you know, will be one to be taken between ministers. Um, the UK government, you know, uh, is obviously keen to make sure that the um, full provisions of the Scotland Act are implemented as, as soon as possible, but there is, there is a balance between uh, speed and, and making sure that there's an orderly uh, and, and stable um, transition of, of the impacts on the public finances. I, I fully accept that. I'm, I'm not trying to get you to answer a question that you may perceive to be political. I'm just asking your professional opinion as to what you think, given the experience to date, would be the more you think at this stage the most appropriate. Well, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be drawn on what was the most appropriate. Um, I mean, since I, I go back to the, just what I said about the implementation of the programme, so far things have gone very smoothly. Uh, with the actual implementation of the programme. So I, I would hope that, you know, a shorter rather than a longer transitional period might be possible. Uh, but, uh, you know, what is, is best you know, is, I'm afraid, a, you know, a, a, an overall judgment of a combination of political and, and fiscal uh, considerations. And when do you think that um, decision might I, be made? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know whether you... I, I don't think you did ask Mr Swinney that last week, but, uh, I, I mean, in a sense, that is, that is a... Uh, a, a decision for, for him and, and UK ministers to, to engage with. Right, OK, fair enough. Well, let's move further into uh, that, uh, well, into uh, Chapter 8. And, well, in, in terms of uh, um, chapter, uh, paragraph 63 down to 66, um, uh, 63 uh, starts with, in relation to stamp duty land tax and landfill tax, the two government, governments continue to work together to consider how Scotland's block grant should be adjusted. There'll be a one-off adjustment, as we know. And then in paragraph 64, it goes on to say, it's been more difficult to determine the nature of a one-off adjustment that is likely to be equitable to both Scotland and the UK in the longer term, specifically a one-off adjustment that reflects not only the revenues currently generated by those ta these taxes, but also the longer-term prospects. How do you believe that can best be achieved? Um, I, I really don't want to sit here and be too unhelpful, but uh, again, I'm not sure I, I can help with this. I mean, this is on uh, the mechanics of, of calculating future revenue values, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and although I'm responsible for the analysts who do the sums, the, the judgment as to the you know, appropriate inclusion in any uh, formula is, is for, it's not for us. Yeah, I was... You, you, you thought I was going to say that, that didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but one can always try. Well, that's yeah. one go. Um, paragraph uh, 66, basically, it talks about uh, a similar approach could be taken for SDLT and landfill tax, albeit through making all Barnet consequentials slightly smaller. And I'm just wondering, uh, slightly smaller, how much smaller, potentially, and what the... What the impact of that might be? I, I, I don't want to go on saying I refer you to my previous answer, but I, I think that's probably the best reply at this point. OK, well, I'm <laughs> going to ask you something which is the, the answer of which is already actually in the paper. Um, but I'll ask you it so that you can maybe expand on it a wee bit and hopefully that should be a wee bit easier. And then I'm going to open out the session to colleagues around the table. Some of them, for example, might want to drill, drill down into some of the numbers, for example, which are, uh, are in the paper. And it's... Um, it's about pension uh, provision and, um, you know, uh, the report says the pension providers will be given until 2018 to develop systems to ensure that Scottish taxpayers receive the right amount of tax relief by adjusting the amount that pension schemes claim from HMRC on their behalf. Um, and it's just uh, what's going to happen before 2018. And I know there is uh, a section on that, um, you know, but I wonder if you can expand on it for the record. Um, well, well, Sarah may want to go into some of the, the, the details, but, but as, as the, the committee knows, because the benefit of, of pension tax relief uh, is dependent on the rate of tax, if, if the Parliament, Scottish Parliament does choose to vary the Scottish rate um, between 20, uh, after 2016, effectively the, the benefit of the tax relief um, will, will be affected for Scottish taxpayers. Um, for those um, taxpayers, which is the majority, who uh, obtain relief at source, i.e. the adjustment is made through the 
um, uh, uh, payment to the pension funds, uh, that would necessitate quite a complex uh, number of adjustments. Um, what will happen between 2016 and 2018 is effectively the, the cost of that will be borne uh, by HMRC and by the UK government should there be a variation of, of, of the rate to avoid the necessity for a UK for any pension fund to uh, have to amend all of their systems at a time which is uh, quite a, a time of change for the pension industry generally uh, ahead of 2018. So no one will be disadvantaged or advantaged apart from uh, the UK government and HMRC which will bear the risk uh, in relation to uh, that interim period. Okay. Well, Sarah, do you want to add to that? Yes, I can give you a bit more detail about how it would work. Um, obviously, um, at the moment, where you make a contribution directly to a pension fund, so this doesn't apply to um, people who, pu who pay t into their employer's fund, which where there's a different way of giving relief. But if you make a personal pension contribution, so you pay to the fund, um, basic rate, you, you make a, a contribution and then the fund claims from the HMRC the value of the pension relief at the basic rate um, on that contribution. Now, in future, the value of a relief at basic rate may be different depending on whether you are a Scottish taxpayer or a rest of the UK taxpayer, if that Scottish rate is different. Um, in the long run, we will expect pension funds to identify, when they make a claim for relief, whether their contributors are Scottish taxpayers or not, so that they can claim relief at the right rate. They need to be able to set, that, set up their systems to make that identification to distinguish between Scottish taxpayers and non-Scottish taxpayers. They won't be able to do that by 2016, which is obviously the first year where the rate might differ. So we're allowing them until 2018 to do that. If in the, those two years, 16, 17, 17, 18, the Scottish rate is different from the UK rate, individuals who make contributions to pension schemes will be entitled to a different amount of relief the difference in that relief will be given back to them by HMRC through an adjustment to their PAYE code or through their self-assessment, rather than by a different rate of claim by the, by the pension fund. So the taxpayer will get the relief, but they'll get it through a different route. Okay, thank you. So I'm now going to open up the session to uh, colleagues around the table. The first person to ask questions will be John, to be followed by Jamie. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, Yes, I mean, one of the very encouraging things in the report was that the costs under SRIT, which had been estimated at 40 to 45 million, are now looking at 35 to 40 million. Uh, so that is encouraging. Can you give us a little background on why uh, that's going to be lower than what we're expecting? Um, I, I will allow, let Sarah uh, talk about the details of that. But, uh, but as I said at the, the, the beginning, um, Broadly, uh, the, although the IT costs have, have moved up very slightly to reflect the pension relief which we, we've talked about, we've simply firmed up uh, the various elements which are enumerated in Annex 6.4 of, of, of the report. And you know, I, I won't say that we'd put over full estimates in, but we put estimates in which we've managed to, to bring down. Um, in part, that reflects uh, the fact that we may be able to take advantage, or we hope we can take advantage of, of, of more automation, which will reduce some of the manual costs uh, which we'd an anticipated as, as we become increasingly digital. Um, I mean, we can go through each of the individual costs, but perhaps I'll let Sarah add anything on the, the details first. Yeah, um, I think what we said we would do was, um, for this report, provide a firm estimate, or reasonably firm estimate, of the non-IT elements of the costs. We won't have a firm, uh, we won't have a quote from our IT suppliers for the IT changes until later this year. So what we've done is, is specify as closely as we can the non-IT elements, and those are uh, things like writing to everybody who we think is a Scottish taxpayer, so po printing and postage for that, dealing with responses because a proportion of those will phone us up and ask questions, um, issuing new tax codes to people um, where, uh, where they have a Scottish tax code, where we'll ha have to send out additional tax coding notices, PAYE coding notices, um, and a certain amount of publicity. We will be uh, using pay paid publicity to remind people of the importance of keeping their address details up to date 
with HMRC. Um, there's also an element in that 25 million for additional work on addre address data to make sure that it is as accurate as we can make it. Um, so some elements of that uh, are pretty firm. Some of them are still contingencies for work that we may well do over the next two years. Um, and uh, a, a large proportion of it obviously depends on the number of people who phone us up or, it, or uh, dispute their Scottish taxpayer status and the cost of dealing with that. And the Scottish Government obviously will only be, claim, will only be charged for the actual cost, which we will be keeping a track of, um, so, and we will try and keep that to the minimum we can. So, so you mentioned um, you know, the kind of accuracy of addresses that you hold, and I, th I think last year when you came to us, you weren't very sure you know, kind of how accurate it is. I mean, is that indicating that it was more accurate than maybe you thought, or are you still not 100% sure about that? We're still working on that. We are still um, doing work to compare our addresses with other th external databases. So we, the post office, for instance, and other, um, there are commercially available databases that uh, show what address people are giving for different, uh, for different purposes. Um, we are working on comparing those. Um, the fact that our address doesn't match somebody else's, the, the address that somebody else holds doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. Um, but it does mean we need to do more work. So I don't have a figure or a percentage yet for how accurate our our addresses are, but we are well advanced with the work that we the plans for the work that we need to do to do that comparison um, and to identify groups of people where we will need to make further inquiries. I, I mean, there are levels of confidence in the costs about the unit cost. We know we have a pretty firm idea of what it costs actually to undertake communications and particular activities, and indeed we are con continually driving those down. The two levels of uncertainty, or two major levels of uncertainty, are one, how much work we're going to have to do, which comes out of the, um, the extent to which the data we have is, is good enough and we have to do further work to improve it, which is the data checking. And then the other area is the extent to which the, the actual action of contacting people results in, in responses and as you have seen we're, we're assuming a 10% contact rate in response to notices and obviously if that's lower then the cost will be lower and if it's higher the cost will be higher so although you know we have experience in a whole lot of fields both with data and with contact this is slightly unknown territory um, because the, there are elements of, of telling people that they're Scottish taxpayers which you know are just different from other things that we do and we, we just do not know quite how how the response is going to be. So there will be a continuing level of uncertainty we, until we actually start undertaking these activities uh, next year. And presumably, I mean, in this whole area of addresses and where people live, um, that there's a kind of one-off starting up position to get as much information as you can. I mean, presumably then it's ongoing because people will move around and new people come into the system, people retire, all that kind of thing. Well, I mean, there will there will be the the the, the sort of continuing cleaning as you know from the initial start, but. But our um, ongoing costs obviously assume people coming and going from Scottish taxpayer status. So the 4.2 million a year includes, uh, you know, a, a cost of taxpayers joining and leaving the system on a continuous basis. And I'm, I'm not quite sure what assumptions we, we've made about how, how many there are, but uh, I assume there are some embedded assumptions about the, the degree of, of, of churn. Yes, I mean, I, I, we are reviewing that estimate of the ongoing annual cost, the 4.2 million, and we will have a better figure for that um, uh, very soon, I hope. Um, and that will probably vary depending on whether there's a change in the Scottish rate in a particular year uh, or not. Um, but uh, I think we are, one of the things we're looking at um, very carefully is, first of all, publicising and trying to change people's behaviour so that they do know, remember to notify us when they change their address or when they move house. Um, and then, which they should be, but in the past it hasn't affected their yes, tax yeah, status. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't <clears throat> put a lot of effort into making sure that that's absolutely a requirement. Um, we're trying to, so we will be change, trying to change people's behaviour just to jog their memories if we can. Um, we're also trying to, to uh, make it as easy as possible for people to notify us of changes of address, for instance, by doing it on a website rather than having to phone us up or write us a letter. Fair enough. 
Um, we have no legal powers to require people to tell us when they change address uh, and indeed sort of have a penalty for not telling us to change addresses would not be an efficient way of achieving it. As, as Sarah says, this is about making it easy for people to notify us and for reminding them that they need to do so and, and, and that's the most cost effective way of keeping the, the address book up to date. Okay. I mean, on the, on the bigger point that actually you, you know, you're slightly, you were overcautious, if you like, and overestimated the costs. I mean, I mean, would you say that is, you normally do that when you're estimating costs? I mean, can we expect all the other estimated costs to come down a bit? Or? Uh, um, no, but obviously we're getting to less trouble if costs come down than if they go up. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we, we, we've, we, we, we've given some, we've given an estimate which we have been able to bring down. But equally, you know, we don't want to be wild, wildly out. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to suggest that somehow these were inflated estimates. And actually, I'm, I'm quite comfortable that we've had a, a modest <coughs> downward revision in the cost, uh, you know, on, on the non-IT. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, another area that's been raised has been um, telling taxpayers how much Scottish rate of income tax they've paid as compared to how much other income tax they've paid. And am I right in understanding that this will be mainly done once a year, which will be around the P60? Um, can you just give us maybe a wee bit of well, the thinking behind that? I mean, this, this was, as you know, a, a decision for the Scottish Government, and I think uh, Mr Swinney may have answered questions on this last week, and obviously there are a range of options uh, available from uh, re requiring the information to be given every time a payment is made, i.e. with the PAY slips for, for employees, although for pensioners... Uh, there's no requirement at the moment for any information about tax deduction to be given by pension payers, so it would, be, it would have been a new obligation, uh, and that would probably be the most extreme end, uh, through to obviously not at the other end not giving any information at all except on request. And what what has been chosen is is the option, as you say, of of including the payment on the P60, which it will be an obligation on employers because it it's for employers to produce the the P60. Uh, and that's followed, as I understand, uh, consultation and discussion with employers and business representatives here. And taxpayers will have um, access through their annual tax statement online once that's fully up and running to, to go online and to see what their tax position is and how much um, Scottish rate they've, they've paid as part of their total tax bill. So that, that's the, that is the proposal. Obviously, you know, th th this is something where you, you know, f in, in future choices could be changed and, and it would be possible um, you know, if, if the government so wished to, to introduce a, an obligation to produce more uh, regular updates of Scottish tax payments. So if I'm understanding that correctly, for, from HR MRC's perspective, it, it doesn't really matter whether people were told weekly or monthly or annually, but it would be mainly it would be the employers that would have a problem because it, they, they it, would have to change their yes. system. Yes, because w we do not have contact with uh, taxpayers on a regular basis. The whole principle of the PAY system is that the responsibility for tax payments uh, is through deduction by the employer from payments and for the majority of, uh, of individuals that with the end of year reconciliation settles their tax liability uh, totally and, and our only contact with the taxpayer in those cases is simply to issue an annual coding notice and, and in the future to, to give them access to an annual tax set statement on, online. So uh, the you know, unless there were a new obligation imposed on HMRC to provide information to employees, the, the, the question of, of, of what information the employee gets is, is one for the employers and, and hence for, for business and employer burdens, which, as I understand it, is, is why the uh, decision has been made just to, to provide annual statements through the P60. OK, thank you. Um, on land and building transaction tax, um, there's mention of Scottish Government continuing to supply HMRC with land transaction data um, could you just expand on why that needs to um, happen? Uh, yes, I mean, for, for both tax administrations, but obviously um, f for us particularly, uh, as, as continuing to administer the uh, majority of taxes, the availability of, of data from all sources is a very important element of our um, compliance information. So uh, that the, the fact that an individual has acquired a property is an indication that he or she has the means to do so, and that is a relevant bit of information for compliance of income tax uh, 
because you know if, if an individual acquires let us say a 200,000 pound property but is recording income of, of, of very little uh, that would raise a flag that they might have undeclared income sources which we should be investigating so to lose access uh, the access we have at the moment to the the data on land transactions would have a significant impact on our compliance activities and and one hypothesizes actually compliance activities relating to Scottish taxpayers as much if not more uh, than than English taxpayers so it is important for the purposes of compliance that we continue to have access to that data and and the data feed which will be established to re to replace the existing data access we have will ensure that that uh, that we have that access and that compliance activities can continue uh, robustly uh, for the future. That's great. And I think my final question um, on landfill tax, again, it seems that the kind of estimated costs are not as a, or are, are were higher than what it looks like actually being. It says um, landfill tax and uh, disapplication costs of landfill tax will not be passed on. So again, you'd expected maybe a little bit more costs or... I, I, sorry, I may want to add on that. I mean, there are, as you know, a, a, a small number of landfill taxpayers anyway for the whole of the UK because it, it is only it is only paid by site operators. I, I don't have the exact number for how many there are in, in Scotland, but the cost of discontinuing them from our systems has been something which we felt that, uh, you know, actually even breaking out the costs, I think, is, it, it, you know, w would hardly be worth it. So we have uh, agreed not to pass on any of the discontinuance costs uh, to... Scotland. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think it's a, a matter that um, they're lower than we expected. I don't think we ever made an estimate of the specifically for the landfill tax costs. And uh, it's as Edward said, once we looked at it, we realised that because it is so, such a small number, we don't have a bespoke IT system or anything like that. The costs are pretty much business as usual for us. So there was no point in us charging the Scottish Government separately for those. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Jamie, to follow by Gavin. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <coughs> Convener, one of the uh, issues that uh, you, you raised there was in terms of the cost imp implementation is communication uh, with Scottish taxpayers. And I see uh, from uh, the report that a joint communication group has been established by HMRC and uh, the Scottish Government and a, a framework uh, for communicating information about the introduction of the devolved taxes uh, is a uh, part of its work, but it's not quite clear who this is to be communicated to. Is this to <coughs> taxpayers generally, or is this to specific uh, groups? Yeah, I think the main the main uh, communications will be to basically solicitors, who are the people who actually handle stamp duty claims at the moment in Scotland. So we will be communicating, obviously, with them. With them. Um, we haven't finalised the um, communications plan. For, uh, for, for the transition, so it may well be that we end up doing some publicity for people who are buying houses. Um, I suspect from our side, there's not a great deal that we need to, I mean, people need to be aware that they'll no longer pay stamp duty to the UK, to HMRC, they will pay land and buildings transaction tax instead. And there may well be that Revenue Scotland will want to publicise that more widely. But in terms, of, in terms of making sure that the right returns are completed and they're sent to the right people, I think it's through the, the representatives and the solicitors who handle the transactions. We need to make sure that they understand what they need to do. Is that work underway yet or has that still been developed? The I suppose quite, are people being contacted yet? Or? Um, we have um, we have a sort of newsletter that goes round to uh, to people who are interested in stamp duty land tax, and we've had um, sort of mentions in the in our sort of regular communications to say that the transition is coming along. It's still relatively early days, and that will ramp up over the course of the year. And, and I think there's been engagement with the Law Society of Scotland oh, yes, and indeed, other professional yes. bodies who I think do their own internal communications about this as well. Yes, indeed, yes. We do have a, a consultation group of representatives of, of, of the relevant bodies and uh, they have been kept very closely in touch. Okay, that, that's good to know. And we've already discussed with the Deputy Convener uh, issues around uh, the P60 and the Scottish rate of income tax uh, being reported on an annual basis through uh, uh, individuals <coughs> P60. Um, and you mentioned there, Mr. Troop, that obviously the Scottish Government consulted uh, with uh, the business sector uh, in advance of that decision. But I see from uh, the report that uh, you too will be consulting 
uh, employers and the specific changes required to the P60. Uh, is that underway yet, or um, is that still in, in, in the that hasn't stage? Begun, that hasn't begun yet. Um, we have regular, every time, there are fairly regular changes to the format of these forms. We have a, fair, a standard way in which we, compl we, we consult employers and payroll providers about changes to our standard forms. Um, there are. This will not be the only change, I think, to the P60, which is coming up for April 16. So, or in fact, it will be. Uh, it'll be. After, it'll be in 2017 because it'll be at the end of the year. So there's a little time to go yet. Um, but it ha so it hasn't begun yet, and it will be part of our routine consultation. Okay. I mean, there's a general point on communication, which again I think we discussed last time, which is that you need to get it right. There's no point in communicating too early because actually people then forget by the time they need to do it. So, uh, but in relation to the employers, as Sarah says, there's an annual cycle, there's an ongoing cycle. So this will be part of the cycle relevant for the P60s in, in April 17. So consultation is a sort of routine thing and this will just be part of it then. Okay, that, that, that's helpful. One last question. I mean, I was just returning to uh, the estimated uh, costs. Um, they can, the deputy can sort of explore some of the area I wanted to, but I suppose it's just a, a general question. I mean, it's very positive that uh, these costs have, uh, the estimated costs have been coming down. Is there scope, do you think, for them to come down further still? <laughs> Well, um, you know, we are always trying to reduce our costs, as I think I said when I was here last year. And, you know, indeed, overall, um, we are trying to, you know, through the use of digital, through the use of automation, uh, to reduce costs generally. And, and as you know, um, you only bear the direct specific costs. So to the extent that the investment which we have planned, and we have quite a lot of digital and other investment planned, reduces our overall costs and our unit costs, you will get the benefit of that. But we don't have anything where I can specifically say, uh, yes, I think this will come down. But, you know, while I'm not going to, as I didn't do last year, is to say I can promise one way or another, I'll be disappointed if we can't continue to, to, to put pressure on costs because it's something we do all the time. OK, thank you. OK, Gavin. Thank you. Um, Mr Tripp, you said in your opening statement we recently had an OGC gateway review um, which got amber green. Can you just expand on, on what that actually is and, and what that really means in practice? Um, so again, Sarah will cover the details, but the Office for, Office for Government uh, Commerce, um, as, as, as you may know, um, operates a series of, of, of gateways on, on all significant projects um, uh, as they go through uh, as an independent assessment, independent to whoever's running the project of of, of the, 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 prog the progress. This is the second gateway review we've had of this particular project, um, and uh, very few get a, a clear green. Um, not too many get a clear red, but uh, uh, there are a lot of ambers and amber reds. Uh, an amber green, as I say, is about as good as you can get. It's, it's effectively saying this, this project is going well, uh, but as, as you know, you'd expect of any examiner, they, they found a few things where they feel we could make a few changes. Sarah may want to say what are the elements where they, they put a bit of amber on. Yeah. Um, yes, in fact... This is the second r review we've had at the programme level, so looking at the entire implementation. That's all, there has also been an external review of the income tax uh, project, which is implementing the change of Scottish income tax, which again um, had a similar rating, so amber green. Um, they, the, the report um, was very happy with the way in which we're working closely with the Scottish Government and the collaboration that's going on, and I was very pleased with that. Um, they asked us, the one specific thing they asked us to, to pay attention to this time is to make sure that our plans for the close down of SDLT and the introdu introduction of the land and buildings transaction tax are, are kept under very close review and that we do joint planning with the Scottish, with Revenue Scotland and the Scottish Government to make sure that that transition is smooth. And obviously, at the point where we are at the moment in the implementation, with now less than a year to go to that date, that's got to be a priority for us. So I'm very happy with that recommendation. And just for completeness, the, the amber green, or the, the review that happened, that was in relation to Scottish rate of income tax and stamp duty, LBTT, and land, because yes. it, it was all three taxes. The whole project. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, just for other question, age 12 of 
your second annual report. We've had obviously a couple of questions on costs already, but I just want to ask specifically about the costings for the current financial year. Um, so it's paragraph 14. HMRC has stated has shared with the Scottish Government an estimate of five to six million pounds for 2014-15. Um, does my question is does that remain the case that prediction? Um, I, I believe so. Yes. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, the only caveat to that is that the split of the split of cost between 2014-15 and 15-16 will depend on the scheduling of the IT changes. Um, as I've said, we will not have a definite cost or schedule for the IT work until later in this year. So at the moment, that's that, in terms of how much of the spending falls in the current year and how much falls in the next financial year, that will depend on that scheduling, which we don't yet have. OK, thank you. That's all. Thank OK, you. thank you. Um, there appear to be no further questions from members of the committee. However, I'll just um, ask a couple of further ones uh, myself. And the first one is um, to ask, uh, what is the, the lag between the end of the financial year and outturn figures being available uh, for the Scottish Rate of Income Tax? And when can we expect the first set of outturn figures uh, to be published? Um, Sarah, yeah. um, what we're hoping to be able to do is to publish in our annual accounts in the summer of 2017, so that um, will be in the summer following the end of the first year, an estimate of the, of, of the revenue from the Scottish Rate of Income Tax, and then a final figure a year later. Um, it takes us uh, about a year to collect and to reconcile all the figures uh, for income tax revenue um, the deadline for self-assessment returns, as you know, is January after the end of the year, so clearly most of that, won't, we, we won't have hardly any of it um, immediately after the end of the year. For a PAYE as well, we do a reconciliation process, which is over the sort of summer-autumn to make sure that we have properly allocated tax, um, people's income tax, and in some cases... We won't be able to determine whether somebody's Scottish taxpayer status finally until after the end of the year because obviously it depends on your residence for the year as a whole. So we will publish the best estimate we have um, in summer 2017, but we will have an accurate figure which will then be relevant, which is at the point at which it's used for the block grant adjustment in some in summer 2018. So that's two years, 18 months after the end of the year. But, but as we get over 80% of the tax in year, um, the summer 17 figure will give a very good indication, um, and obviously the summer 18 figure will give, I mean, there, there are always dribs and drabs, but it, it will be substantially all of the tax by that point. But there will be, very, you know, the first year's indication will be, uh, you know, pretty complete as a combination of actual receipts and forecast of the balance. OK, uh, thank you for that. That's very helpful. And uh, can you explain what the role of HMRC will be in uh, making the forecasts for the Scottish rate of income tax and whether the Scottish Government um, has had any involvement in that? Um, well, the um, Office of Bu Budget Responsibility um, actually makes the forecast, but it does so working closely with the analysts uh, in HMRC who have access to all the data and who make you know, as it were, the, the, the initial forecasts. Um, uh, and th there is a sort of uh, extensive scrutiny uh, and engagement process between the HMRC analysts and, and the OBR, but the forecasts uh, do belong to uh, the OBR. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what, in, what in, in involvement there will be uh, f from, from Scotland in that. Um, uh, I, and I'm, I'm also not entirely clear where your Scottish Finance Fiscal Commission you know, has got to or how that will will work. Uh, but uh, we will want to make sure that you are satisfied, you know, with the quality of the forecasting and are able to, um, you know, uh, satisfy yourself that the work that the OBR and we have done is um, is satisfactory. Okay. Um, I believe the, um, the Scottish Government does get involved in some of the meetings that are held with the OBR to discuss their forecast. Um, though obviously they are the OBR's yeah. opinion. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that. 
I mean, that has uh, concluded the questions from the committee. I'm just wondering if there's any further points you would like to make to the committee at this stage. Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, I just repeat what I, I said at the beginning, that we have a very good relationship um, with you. We're, we're off now to uh, see Revenue Scotland to, uh, and, you know, both discuss progress, but also talk about wider things. And as I think I may have said last year, you know, it's, it's very much in our interests that uh, Revenue Scotland uh, is uh, successful and, and forms a job well, because, you know, this is very much a collaborative uh, working relationship to deliver both the devolved taxes but also to to uh, make sure that the Scottish rate of income taxes is delivered so uh, we have a good relationship and uh, I'm, you know I'm, I'm sure that will continue okay well thank you very much for your evidence this morning it's very helpful um, and that being the only item on our agenda this morning I now close the meeting <laughs>